Um, first thing I'm going to say is I'm going to start recording this call momentarily, like right now. Recording in progress. Did you guys hear that? Yep. My computer is now, it didn't used to do that. It didn't used to tell me it was recording. Now it's telling me things. <laughs> All right, so we are recording this meeting. Welcome to the East Falls Community Council General Meeting. Um, my name is Emily Nichols. I'm the president of the Community Council. Um, as I mentioned, we've, we've got a full agenda. I'm just going to ask everyone to try and remain muted when you're not talking. Um, if, if you don't, I, I will go around and, and start hitting mute on people because the background noises create some, some disturbances. Um, if you've got questions, please put them in the chat. Um, if you are not comfortable putting them in the chat, try and sort of use your raised hand feature or, uh, yes, Carolyn has, has raised her hand. I don't know if she's doing a no, demo or she's got that. a question. I was just doing a demo. <laughs> she's doing a demo. Okay, so if you raise your hand, um, I, will, I will call on you. Um, basically, to let you know what we have on the agenda tonight, um, we will do our committee reports. We have an introduction to our new uh, East Falls Development Corporation um, Executive Director. Um, and then we're going to move into our traffic discussion, which is kind of the main highlight of tonight, um, as probably I'm guessing a lot of you know that are on the call. Um, recently, the traffic committee put out a survey into the community, which got a tremendous response. So clearly, this is an issue that everyone um, cares about and is concerned about. And um, we've got some invited folks who we have a few people I know that are already here. And when we get to that point in the meeting, um, Ray will introduce our sort of, uh, I'm going to call them our distinguished guests. Um, some of them actually are nice enough to join us somewhat regularly on our monthly calls, but he'll introduce them and they are going to be here to answer the community's questions and hear directly from, from you guys about what, you know, what your concerns are specifically as it relates to um, traffic and safety in, in East Falls. So that'll be what we'll get to. But first, we will start out with committee reports. And I believe, as always, we really we be it, it all starts and ends with the money. So we start with Joe, our treasurer, to tell us how we're doing. And you're 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 muted, Joe. Joe, you're muted. You're muted. Unmute yourself. Okay. Is that <laughs> you got your? We can hear you uh, now. Sorry. That's okay. Great. We have $106,876,000. Um, of that, most of it is, as I always say, is restricted <clears throat> for the village, $35,570. The um, Friends of Mifflin School, $29,570. The uh, Arboretum around the Mifflin School, uh, $1,455. The Dog Park, $3,002. The community garden, $699, and Michael Play Space, $12,063. It's a balance for use by us of $16,145. And that changes from month to month, depending on when I get the invoices for the newspaper, most likely. So it was a little higher last time. Any questions? Questions regarding our the, the state of our financial world? Yes, no? Okay, thank you very much, Joe. Um, Ray, I don't know if you know this, your camera is doing some really crazy things. You might want to log out and try coming back in to see if that fixes it, or or possibly. Yeah, give me, all right, Bob, Bob Andy, I'll be back in a few minutes. I'll spend. Okay. All right. Um, all right, let's go on to... Well, our traffic committee update is going to happen at the end of the meeting. Um, so I don't know, Zach, I don't know if we really have any updates from events yet. We've started talking about things, but we haven't actually started planning anything. But as we all know, the restrictions in the city have changed. So um, I would say be on the lookout that at some point we are going to try and actually bring the community together live and in person and not just from our living rooms hopefully maybe by the end of the summer that's the goal okay there we go um all right i am going to who am i looking for right now 
there's a lot of i'm not used to having so many people on the call there's so many windows i can't find the folks i'm looking for uh michelle do you want to i want to introduce um do you all know in east falls we uh have the east falls development corporation um we have a new executive director of that and i wanted her to come on and just kind of talk a little bit about development corporation and just introduce herself and then i think uh She's only been with us a month and a half, two months, maybe. A month. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, she might we we might get more in depth in the fall when she's had a chance to to make all her plans for massive development of and great things in East Falls. But go ahead, Michelle. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, and Carolyn, please feel free to jump in. Or Emily, you're on our board. Please feel free to jump in um, and say anything I might be missing or that I should be thinking of. Um, but you know, I I first want to talk a little bit about what we do um, and just a little bit about my background and some of the things we have coming up. Hopefully, not going to take too long. Um, but um, for those who don't know, community development corporations are entities that work to raise the quality of life in a given area. So our mission, um, and we're not a member-based organization, and we're a 501c3, um, and our mission is to make East Falls a, a great place to live, work, learn, and play. Um, and we're focused on the corridor um, at Ridge and Midvale. So we're focused on attracting new businesses, um, we're focused on sensible development um, and technical assistance to our businesses, attracting new ones to fill in vacant spots, um, working with those that are already there in every possible way, shape, and form. Um, we have historically done uh, and spearheaded a lot of um, development planning and studying, so streetscape studies, master plans for the neighborhood, um, those sorts of things that have led to um, implementation funds. So that's part of our history as well. Um, and we're excited to, to keep that going, especially as we um, knock on wood, start to, uh, like we were all saying before, leave our homes. So we see a lot of opportunity um, to do in-person work as well, which we're really, really excited about. Um, so I also wanted to say that I'm just, I'm excited to work with everybody. I'm excited to meet everybody. Um, and hopefully in person, I'm actually gonna put my email address and my phone number in the chat so that anybody who wants to can follow up with me. I'd love to talk, um, get to know you, um, what you love about East Falls. Um, and I also wanted to mention a couple of things we have coming up um, that hopefully um, you've heard about. But one is the river landing. Um, so we are going to break ground at some point in the next few weeks. Um, no set date yet on the river landing. Um, so new access point to the school, which is really exciting. Um, there will be all kinds of information coming out about that, but there is a Friends of the River Landing Facebook page. Um, so I'll put that in the chat as well, so you'll be able to get all kinds of news from that as well as from our Instagram um, as construction happens, um, all of that good stuff. We are also going to be relaunching our website in the next few days, so we're really excited about that as well, and we want to hear from everyone you know, what we can do to make it more of a community resource and tool. If there are other pages you think we should build out that would be really helpful, um, we would love to hear that um, as well. And the last thing I'll mention really quickly, because tonight's meeting is focused on traffic, is we put in um, a grant with the state, DCED, um, a couple of weeks ago now um, for a neighborhood traffic study. Um, so it was focused on the idea that people are going to be coming I will focus on what we're going to talk about tonight, which is all the traffic issues in the neighborhood. Um, but we're going to have new folks coming, different, you know, people traveling to the new river landing, and how can we use that new river landing to solve some of the longstanding traffic issues in the neighborhood? Um, so it'll be a neighborhood-wide traffic study. We, uh, we're hopeful that we'll get the funds. Um, if we don't, we actually have an opportunity to reapply in a few months um, in February. So if we don't get it this time, hopefully we'll get some feedback and, and get it next time. But I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that we're, you know, we're really aligned on, on that mission as well. Um, and the last thing I'll say before I sort of hand it over um, and hand it back is just to reiterate that I'm, I'm really happy and excited to be here. Um, and I would really love to meet all of you and, and hear your, you know, hear your East Falls stories and your East Falls um, hopes and, and dreams that we can work together on them. And um, Emily or Carolyn, did I miss anything? Well, could you just tell them a little bit about your background? Oh, sure. I think, yeah. I think that's really interesting. <laughs> I can 
can do that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, born and raised in Philadelphia, um, and my career has been primarily focused on neighborhood-based work uh, here in the city. So um, for about two and a half years, I worked for the Frankfurt CDC. I was the commercial corridor manager um, and headed up all of our communications and promotions for the corridor and for our businesses. Um, and then for about five and a half years, I uh, ran Keep Philadelphia Beautiful. So still community and economic development, uh, but focused on sustainability. Um, so we were uh, focused on litter, recycling, zero waste, um, and education and outreach around, around those issues. So we primarily work with the streets department. Um, as opposed to the Commerce Department, that we did a, a lot of work with CDCs around the city. Um, so I, I um, you know, I got to know a lot of different, uh, you know, folks in the CDC world, um, amazing people on the ground, um, and learned a lot about, you know, how different CDCs um, across the city operate. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll be able to bring some of those learnings here to East Falls. Michelle, thank you very much. Um, and as as someone who who has met Michelle and had a chance to talk to her a little bit more as part of the selection process for Development Corporation, I am thrilled. Um, we are very fortunate to have her. She brings a lot of great experience and enthusiasm, and um, I think it'll be very very good for our neighborhood. Um, I realize I think that uh, Ray's flashing camera. I don't know if the rest of you were getting it, but I was getting a strobe light situation. Um, through me, and I totally skipped over uh, our zoning committee, which, I, I mean, not much happens in zoning, but Hillary might have a couple updates. Um, I actually think we have a we have a busy zoning month ahead. There's there's a lot going on, so he will just provide some quick updates for you all. Absolutely. Uh, here's a quick one. Uh, the, uh, I'm going to describe very briefly our agenda for our Wednesday meeting. Uh, we have two projects, one coming up on Roberts Avenue and um, the other one half a block away on Stokely. Uh, they're both uh, applications for a restaurant use in an existing building. Uh, we're sharing that agenda with uh, Ridge Allegheny Hunting Park. Uh, Rosalie Cooper uh, would like to be working with us because um, they're having so many applications uh, and we are too as of the last three or four days uh, within our shared border. Um, so we'll be looking at those two, two projects. They'll be, be presented, uh, 3570 to 74 Calumet, which is three proposed townhomes up behind Chuck's garage. Um, that is going to be a proposal reviewed by the neighbors, uh, before Argos, uh, take that project to, uh, zoning to get refusals and then go through the whole zoning process on that. So, um, and then we're shifting the new Cortland update. Uh, that is not going to be a zoning meeting for them. It's just going to be an update. Uh, they're planning a whole uh, uh, bunch of parking and new units, I, I suspect in the high rise portion. Um, so they'll be describing that scheme. So that's all for Wednesday. Please tune in. Uh, go to the zoning page on the website, read all about it, um, and plug in. Um, some of the other updates, a um, couple of projects, 3445 Division Street. We actually uh, won uh, that at the ZBA, um, opposed the project. They want to squeeze uh, small townhomes onto a small site. Um, they are appealing that at common pleas. Um, so if we don't follow them up the legal chain, uh, they will get to build what they want. So um, on behalf of the neighbors, I recommend that we'll probably want to be seeking uh, legal help on that one. Um, update on 3018 Midvale, which is illegal construction in the alleyway up by McMichael Park. Uh, they have since uh, reapplied uh, with the correct um, wording and grammar on the application. They have new refusals and they've also um, modified their project. Um, however, it's still uh, within the zoning code, it's still too high, it's in the wrong place, it's too big and the primary use proposed is not allowed in the district. 
Um, so there's no date set on that. And, um, and finally, uh, a quick summary on 4401 Ridge Avenue, Ridge and Merrick. Uh, we've been through two community design reviews. Uh, that process started in January and it concluded on May 4th with the second uh, community design review. Uh, some of the comments are incorporated, such as adding green roofs, um, and they added a few balconies to the elevations, but the, the essential uh, model, the, the plan, the footprint has, has not changed. Um, so it was slated to go to its first zoning hearing on June 9th. Uh, that uh, was continued uh, to August 17th on the grounds that um, Councilman Jones and PHA had actually uh, recommended that uh, an additional meeting, which will now be held with neighbors on June 29th, will need to be held uh, so that they can weigh their support uh, for the project. Uh, but additionally, um, they also did not post the zoning hearing sufficiently. So it was continued to August the 17th. And keep your eyes open for the community-wide meeting on June 29th. Um, that will be um, for that project. Any questions? Hillary, what about the is the master plan still part of this month's zoning agenda? Uh, no. Um, okay. <clears throat> so uh, the master plan with Penn Charter, um, there is going to be a kickoff meeting at the end of June, but with the summer recess, uh, that would be a kind of a false start. Uh, so we thought that September would be the best time for that kickoff meeting. Okay. Um, what they're looking to do is to get an entire master plan approval uh, within the special district uh, uh, planning ordinance uh, for either institutions or schools. And that would enable them to uh, build all the different projects on the campus under one approval uh, without coming back for various, um, various uh, hearings and uh, meetings with the community. So that is going to start up in September. Okay. Are there any questions um, from the community about zoning? I will say if you do want to get more involved, learn more about any of, of, of these different properties and projects that are coming before zoning, um, zoning committee meeting will be this Wednesday. Um, generally, we have our community council meetings on the second Monday and zoning on the third Wednesday, but the weird way this month fell the second Monday and the third Wednesday, we're in the same week. So in two days, you can dial back in and uh, join the zoning meeting. Um, and just a reminder that the we will be sending out notifications. There will be a community meeting specifically about 4401 Ridge um, on Tuesday, June 27th. Um, that is almost definitely on Zoom, but we're also contemplating whether or not we can pull make make an in-person happen. Um, I don't know. I'm going to see what I can do in the next week and see if there's any of our uh, venues that we used to use that have yet decided to reopen themselves to allowing us access to do an actual in-person meeting. Um, yeah, if anybody uh, remember what those are like in person It is the 29th, Emily. It's yes. the 29th. 27th is a Sunday. Oh, sorry. Yeah, June, June, 20, June 29th, which is a Tuesday. So Tuesday, June 29th. Wow. Um, and then I also wanted to mention, Michelle did not, uh, I don't think mention this in her update, but um, this coming Thursday under the Twin Bridges, we will have uh, b the beer garden um, happening from 6 to 10 o'clock. Um, it happened last summer. It was really successful and lovely. So this is our, our first chance to kind of resume. Well, not last summer. I guess it happened two summers ago. Sorry, I'm just skipping over the whole pandemic. I'm going to pretend it never happened. Um, so back in back in uh, 2019, we, we did this thing called the Beer Garden, and it was lovely. So this will be the first one back. Um, so I definitely encourage everyone in the neighborhood to go down there and check it out. Um, it should be nice. And I think 
we we are doing well on our updates if there's no questions we're going to move into traffic because we do have a a lot to share um ray i am going to make it possible whoops that's not what i want to do i don't want to share my screen nobody wants to see what's on my computer um ray you should be able to share your screen if um if you want to sort of introduce our panel and folks from traffic and we'll share with you guys the results from our uh, traffic survey and ray you're muted i see your name though there i'm you. here <laughs> hi ray hello it's a voice from well depending upon your perspective or point of view from above or from the nether, nether world below i'm sure some folks do think i'm from the below but beyond that Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, our invited officials, both elected and appointed. Uh, I see State Representative Pam Delizio. Thank you so much for being here. State Representative Derisha Parker. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Parker. Uh, Mr. Mark Washington from the Streets Department. Thank you. Uh, Mr. David, David D also from the Streets Department, um, who was our regional traffic engineer. And Mark, Mr. Washington, I believe you're assistant chief traffic engineer for the city? That is correct. I'm the assistant chief traffic engineer uh, for the Philadelphia Streets Department. Okay, I'm glad. And I, I was the uh, former former traffic engineer for East Falls, like, wow, 15 years ago. <laughs> so. uh, okay, under Mr. Denny. Yes. Okay, and Ms. Uh, Samantha Williams from um, Councilman Jones' office. Thank you, Ms. Williams, for attending uh, this important meeting. Um, myself, uh, Meg Greenfield, Henry Donner. Uh, let's see who else I can find. Mr. Allen, Dr. Alan Schindler. Um, let's see, uh, Meg. Am I missing anybody else? I think. I'm, these are our uh, present members of East Falls Traffic, uh, East Falls Community Council Traffic Committee. So I did not mention they're not here, but Ellen Kennedy, Jean Bowles, um, thank you to Deborah Feldman, uh, Mr. Michael, uh, Mr. Michael Markovitz, as well as um, uh, Bill Epstein. I don't think he's here either. All right, folks, let's get to the meat of the matter. And I think we all know why we're here. And um, Emily, I'm going to try to screen share on your platform if that's the right word so please bear with me for a moment does everybody kind of see this <laughs> I, uh, have i made a successful share yes you have that looks yes great. you have okay. and you have it uh, nice and maximized it's wonderful <laughs> not bad for an old head Okay, look, we're, we're here for very important reasons, all kidding aside. Um, events of recent weeks um, uh, really underscored the, um, the, the problem and the, and the terrible frequency of collisions among vehicles and be between vehicles and pedestrians. As documented here, a young man who was struck down by a hit and run driver um, in the early morning, uh, early morning hours in April. Uh, at that time, he was in a coma, and as of May 7th, his mother was uh, still pleading for the uh, perpetrator to come forward. We had uh, four fatalities um, between April 18th and May 19th, including uh, three teenagers killed in a car accident on Kelly Drive uh, between uh, the cemetery and North Ferry Road, and a, a young man uh, illegally operating a dirt bike on uh, Henry Avenue. Um, as if, uh, and as if to underscore the, you know, the frequency of these events, uh, April 18th and 19th in about an 18 hour period, remarkable set of events, including the one I just mentioned, the young man being killed on a dirt bike at the intersection of Henry and Roberts. Uh, one, that was at 5 p.m., I'm sorry, one o'clock at Fox and Queen, a remarkable uh, collision which sent uh, an automobile across sidewalks. And according to the neighbor that I interviewed, sometime between uh, 12 midnight and 3 a.m. on April 19th, a two-car uh, incident uh, in which one vehicle left the street. As you can see, traveled along the sidewalk. This is the corner property, which, by the way, recently sold uh, and careened through the fence and onto the lawn of the property. Now, sadly, these are not isolated incidents. You know, rather, you know, they're really like part of an historical pattern. And we can go all the way back 
And we've been keeping photographic records since 2006, 2007. And the, one of the most remarkable was this event on Mother's Day in 2009, uh, three doors up from the corner of Midvale Avenue, McMichael Street, in which a vehicle left the road and ended up on the uh, bushes right in the front bay window of the uh, of one of the twin houses you see here, directly across the street from McMichael Park. And Midvale through the years has been, you know, um, a place of many, many incidents, collisions, oftentimes uh, cars leaving the road, ending up on the sidewalk and the corner of Fox and Midvale. Uh, and, and that can be attested by many people who live in the community is particularly dangerous. Uh, um, many, many accidents. In fact, two weeks after that, after, after this accident, a similar accident occurred, two vehicles, and this time both properties were impacted. Uh, Fox Street also is has been a problem with speeding traffic uh, towards uh, going to and coming from the uh, U.S. Route 1 Roosevelt Expressway. Um, oftentimes, um, what pedestrians come across are the, the, remain, the, the reminders of such, ac such accidents, broken fire hydrants, down street signs. We came upon this vehicle soon after an accident in 2006 in which the vehicle burst into flames. Most recently, as documented by uh, neighbors Bill and Francis, a four-car accident last Saturday uh, at on Fox Street near the intersection with Penn, four vehicles, and I believe um, one of the vehicles left the scene even before the police arrived. And of course, one of our favorite streets of all, Henry Avenue, with his usual array of, of um, collisions and incidents, is also a, 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 just a marker of, of the frequency of these incidents day after day, I mean, week after week, month after month, year after year, uh, including uh, and the police, of course, um, rushing to the scene end up sometimes being part of the collisions. So. As I said, none of this is happenstance or once once a year or once in a decade. And they're, they're part of a pattern of incidents at all times of the year, all kinds of weather, and usually resulting in serious uh, injuries and sometimes fatalities as this one, very famously. And the evidence is always left as mute testimony, whether it's a smashed telephone pole, down street lights, even traffic, uh, even uh, historical markers uh, are are sometimes. Uh, this is after the historical marker was moved from Henry Avenue to Coulter Street, so even the Kelly House is not immune from um, from the mayhem. And so, uh, and unfortunately, uh, you know, new problems are cropping up all the time, uh, including now, as reported to me by neighbors uh, on and near Indian Queen Lane. Uh, tractor trailers are drivers of tractor trailers for whatever reason are electing to uh, drive down Indian Queen Lane and move their rigs, literally drive their rigs from Henry Avenue, sometimes attempted to go in Scott's Lane. Don't ask me what happens once they reach the, uh, the railroad bridge near the former uh, East Falls Garden. But if you can see this one, this picture uh, posted on Facebook recently, uh, one of those rigs uh, right before reaching Ridge Avenue, smashed into a car. So, um, all of this under, all of this just serves as uh, you know visual evidence to what people have been talking about for many years. So, recently, the traffic committee and the executive committee of East Falls Community Council elected to conduct a survey, and the survey was conducted among residents of East Falls uh, online via uh, Survey Monkey and in person at polling places on our most recent election day in May, and also among recipients of street trees, uh, who because they represent a broad uh, cross-section of the community uh, from all ends of um, um, East Falls. Now I'm going, I'm, I have a separate presentation for that. So hold on to your horses while I stop to share on this one. And let's see if I can success, ah, uh, yes, here we go. Oops, did I share that? No, probably not. So I'll share my screen. And whoops, go back, go back. Come on. Oh, where is it? <laughs> and while Ray is doing that, just kind of a reminder to folks that if you want to, um, if you have any questions as he's talking, just go ahead and put them into the chat and then 
And then once we've kind of done this introductory period, then we will we'll start to address questions. Just give me a moment, folks. Ah, I knew it was there. Okay, let's go. Oh boy, let's see if we can get on to, you know, help me with this. Whoops, didn't want to do that. And do it. All right, well, I'm trying to. And do it. Here we go. I apologize, folks. All right, so here are the results of the survey. And are folks able to read the question, question number one? If you want, Ray, I can read through it kind of quickly for, for everyone. Sure. There's, we've we've got numeric depictions of the responses. So first to say 325 community members responded to the survey um, that we put out. Uh, I think um, we, we left it open for about a week, maybe a little bit longer. Um, thinking about the block where you live, nearby intersections, cross or routes that you travel, what, what areas are you most concerned about? And um, or what what issues are you most concerned about? The speed vehicle traveled was, was sort of the number one area of concern, followed by aggressive driving, followed by safely crossing intersections. Um, and then you can see some of the other results. And just to let you guys know, we will put post these survey results um, somewhere on our website so that at any point folks can can uh, look go look at them. If right. If, if, I'm sorry, Emily. Mm -hmm. Now, if I may just chime in, yeah, this this question was designed in mind with the idea of just asking respondents, excuse me, for their impression, their impression of traffic and speeding problems and what impressed them uh, the most as a safety issue. And, and as you stated, yes, quite correct. The speed, the speed at which vehicles travel throughout the neighborhood uh, edged out to be number one, but closely followed by, uh, number two by what uh, aggressive driving. And, and then just being able to safely cross intersections. And you can see right. the breakdown. And then if you go to the third slide, do you worry about your per personal safety while walking, biking, driving in East Falls? And um, a little over 70% said that they did. So that's, that's obviously something we want to address. Mm -hmm. um, going down to the seventh slide. Do concerns about safety as a pedestrian, cyclist, or driver factor into your thinking about visiting local parks, playgrounds, restaurants, or other businesses? Um, and then uh, it was split, as you can see. Um, a little more people said no than yes, but there's also still a high percentage of folks who um, are making decisions about visiting businesses and parks and restaurants in East Falls because they're, they have concerns about, about their safety. Yeah, and as an example, uh you may want to ask someone who just, um, this reflects attitude as far as how they feel about walking along the streets or um, to, a, to a desired destination. So for example, we often walk our dog to McMichael Park and the decision is to whether or not to cross Henry Avenue or not because of the safety issue. And then slide nine. Are you surprised to learn that 2020 was Philadelphia's worst year for fatal car crashes in decades, up 54% from October 2019 to October 2020? And let's keep in mind that for at least half of that time period that was measured, we were in quarantine. And yet, this this is we've had the worst year ever for traffic fatalities. Um, and so I guess I guess most people around East Falls know this to be the case. They were not that surprised. Um, close to 70% were surprised by this result. Yeah, and, I, and if I may add, I, I also think that it's not surprising considering how much uh, media play was, uh, how much the media profiled this issue, especially in that time period. So people's awareness was raised by, from a, by a number of factors and through a number of avenues. And then uh, slide 11, overall, how concerned are you about pedestrian and traffic safety? And over 70% of you, I think close to 75, are concerned. Um, you guys are very concerned, and that's obviously, we, we can see this because that's why you're here tonight. Right. And this was, um, 
This was, when the question appeared in the survey, it was a ranking from zero to 100. So the survey uh, aggregated those results. So to get an overall uh, gauge of, of um, perception of, of uh, safety in East Falls. And as Emily just said, this is remarkably high. And then slide 13, which is basically looking at, you know, we asked everyone to rank what they thought were the most dangerous to the least dangerous streets. I don't think any of us are surprised um, that Henry Avenue is, is, was considered to be the most dangerous, um, followed by Midvale, followed very closely by Ridge, um, then Fox, Schoolhouse, Calumet, Merrick, and Palisades. So, you know, I think a lot of what we might be talking about tonight has, has to do with Henry and Ridge and Midvale as our main intersections, but um, especially as, as, as Ray's slide presentation showed us with this new thing of tractor trailers dri driving down uh, Indian Queen Lane, like that's, you know, we, we have concerns on our side streets as well, where you, right. your children play and your, and your pets wander around and you also want to be able to safely cross the street. So the, those are some concerns. Yeah, and, and if I can just add quickly, the, the problems and concerns are manifested in a number of different ways. Another problem that's been put, uh, that has been expressed by many residents on uh, Indian Queen Lane in proximity to Scotts Lane and the uh, charter school at um, the Falls Center is the queuing of uh, school buses uh, uh, before and after school, which is creating a, a whole host of issues. So the problems are really all over, but of course, certain pattern patterns of, um, of, of speeding and um, endemic traffic rule violation are, are mostly seen again, uh, Henry Ridge and Midvale. Now this re question really gets to what, what can we do about this? And so we asked uh, folks, you know, do you think that driver compliance with safety rules would improve if traffic calming features were built? And um, over 70% of you, close to 75, said yes. And so I think those are some of the, the things that our traffic committee looks at is what can we ask um, you know, PennDOT and the streets department to do in our neighborhood that might actually help alleviate this. Um, I, I believe somewhere in one of the survey responses I read, uh, somebody said the real problem is just how the drivers drive. And unfortunately, we're not able to force everyone to go back to, to driving school. So maybe there's something else we can do like traffic calming. Right. And, and I think it reflects uh, an attitude and a belief and a hope that um, some authentic uh, solutions can be implemented uh, beyond what folks are trad traditionally used to in receiving, uh, not only in East Falls, but throughout the city of Philadelphia, because evidently, um, you know, um, casual efforts as, you know, putting up uh, directional signals or uh, posting of speed signs are not really having the efficacy, both uh, in terms of uh, perception, and, and I would bet my bottom in, in measurement of, of actual reduction in incidents. So I think more than anything, this does um, seem to convey a sense of urgency and people want something done. And then, you know, this is possibly maybe partially directed to, to some of our guests on the call, you know, when mm -hmm. should public officials implement traffic calming measures on a particular block? And you know, 70, I said, most people think that um, in response to a community request, considering public safety overall was, was, was a, a big thing, which I think we've, we're looking at that now with the responses to the survey and the folks that are on this call. Folks also said that if 75% or more of the residents on a block agree that something should be done. So I know that some, some of you live on blocks where speed cushions and other measures have been put in place. Um, and then those are, those are the two that I focus on because the other two responses really didn't, didn't get as much response, but I don't, I think, you know, unfortunately we've had injuries and deaths in these falls. So we've already passed that point. Um, and at, at which we have to sort of take action that's happened and we'd like to have action happen before there's more of that. 
Right, I, I agree with Emily. And the 75% item is, um, <clears throat> that's, the, um, that's a reflection of the current protocol in place in which um, 75% and that, in other words, the, um, the residents, the residents of a block or a street have to be polled and 75% of them have to agree to the um, data changes. And um, sometimes there's a logistical issue associated with that uh, in a more recent episode in which we're working, we decide to work with the block separately, the 3000 block of, of Queen Lane, which is experiencing also speeding issues and to comport with recommendations um, from elected officials um, we attempted to get 75% of the residents to respond. We were 100% successful in total response on one side, which were all private homes and all owner occupied homes. The other side of the street, which is an apartment complex, not one person responded as of today after a three or four week effort. Uh, mostly, uh, a lot of the footwork was done by a resident of that block, Ms. Suzanne Penn. I'm not sure if she is here tonight or, or whatever. Um, hey, I have, I've got a raised hand in the chat. Meg, you, you have a question or, or a comment specific to the, this part yes. of the survey? Yes, but specific to the 75% requirement, which has been imposed. And I have a fundamental problem with it because the residents are not the only people who use those blocks and it exposes all the drivers to uh, the lot knowledge or lack of knowledge or of the residents and it seems to me that if there is a traffic safety problem which puts all users of that road at risk then at it should not be determined by the residents of the block as to whether or not effective calming measures are put in place. That doesn't make any real sense. May, we may don't I, set speed limits that way. We don't do a whole lot of other things that way. Uh, we don't decide vaccines are effective or not effective for measles, mumps, and rubella on the basis of a poll of parents and kids, we try to rely on science. And that approach of the 75% requirement does not rely on science. So I find it's fundamentally flawed and I just want to say. No, that's Meg, that's a, that's a great comment. What I'd like to do is really save the comments. We've only got a few more slides to share with you of the survey results. And then we will open it up and, and that's the point at which we will we'll do all the comments. Um, I do see two comments in the chat, which I'll get to just in a moment, although someone, Nancy, I don't know if you had more that you wanted to say. I only see a, a, a few yeah. words. Yeah, sorry, um, I'm, I'm redoing it. Sorry about that. Okay, and then and then I will call I will call on the folks who, who put some comments into the chat. David, do you mind if I call on you um, after we get through just a few more slides? Yeah, well, let me just make one one quick sentence. Is that the 75% isn't exactly true, and I'll, I'll get to that when you're done with the presentation. We will, okay, so I've already I've already figured out that 75% is gonna be a, a little part of our conversation tonight. Um, the next on slide 19, or, or page 19, I don't know, slide 19. <laughs> what is a reasonable, acceptable period of time for city or state officials, authorities, or agencies to respond when an actionable safety concern is identified. Um, and most of you think that well, there should be response within a year. And so we will, um, I, I, I just make note of that and probably note of that again for some of our invited guests on that call that, you know, we, we don't expect things to be done tomorrow, but we do expect within a reasonable amount of time that when these concerns are raised, and I think a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight are concerns that have been raised with folks uh, for a while now. Yeah, and if I, I'm sorry, if I can add on to that, Emily, um, you know, in a recent conversation you and I had, um, for whatever reason, why, well, because I'm the chair of the traffic committee, I, um, for better or for worse, I, I feel a lot of, e I feel, I receive a lot of emails from folks throughout the community, uh, community and one of the, uh, big complaints is the time factor. 
Uh, in other words, they're, they're saying that the city does not respond in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a reasonable amount of time. Weeks go by, months go by, years go by, and this is a repeated um, um, a statement, a repeated frustration. Uh, so again, uh, here you have in front of you some data which does seem to speak, which in fact does speak uh, uh, to what people are feeling about this. And so it certainly would seem to me as well as any um, dispassionate or unbiased person looking at this, um, government response needs to be speeded up and in the interest of saving lives. And the last uh, slide results that the question result that we'll share with you has to do with something that I'm sure you have all experienced in the streets of Philadelphia, ATVs and dirt bikes. Should the city do more to enforce laws making it illegal to operate an ATV or dirt bike in Philadelphia? And over 80% of you believe that yes, uh, more action needs to be taken to curtail this. Yeah. And so, if I can, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Go ahead, Ray. Yeah. If I can jump in, I'd like to remind folks that um, one of the fatalities, I believe, was the April, yeah, April 18th, the day of the three incidents. Uh, that was a, and it wasn't a kid, it was a young man, 25 years old. Uh, Ill illegally operating a dirt bike on Henry Avenue. And again, um, there is a, you, everyone can go to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Department of Transportation and look this up. The Commonwealth of, of Pennsylvania has outlawed the use of these vehicles on all city streets. And it's a very well prepared uh, website which clearly outlines what you can and where you can and where you may not operate these vehicles. So, um, and also, the law is also particularly for, the law. Real the irony is the law was was um, written and put into place to protect the operators of those vehicles. The, those vehicles, the riders ride low. They're out of sight lines of large vehicles like trucks and buses and uh, SUVs. And yes, it was a SUV uh, who uh, rammed into this young man. So. Everyone's life is placed at risk by the illegal operation of these vehicles. And I think we need to throw out all ambiguities associated with it and look at it as a problem that needs to be dealt with. As, as we can see, uh, the folks of our community are, are overwhelming in the majority of, yes, they need to be, that law needs to be enforced. So um, I'm going to ask I'm going to ask uh, Ray to stop sharing his screen if only that, that way we can see more of each other. Um, I want to share a couple more things in in the survey. There was a space allotted for people to put comments. Um, we had an extraordinary amount of comments, far more than I will share tonight. But I, I will mention one thing that we haven't really talked about yet, and maybe an oversight we made when we invited um, sort of our, our 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 guests to be part of this that a lot of people talked about enforcement. Um, so, you know, that that is an issue that I'm not sure how much anyone on this on this call will be able to talk about, but a lot of people talked about there, there's not a lot we can do about enforcement. Um, and I am the only other comment that I, I wanted to share, and it's completely out of self-interest, um, as a reminder to the members of the community that uh, of why we have East Falls Community Council, somebody said, and it wasn't me, I swear, because I, I don't think I actually answered the survey. This is one of the most important issues facing the neighborhood, and I'm very glad to see it addressed by EFCC. I think it's gotta be a very important issue because at this moment, we have we have really like three times as many people on this call as we've had for several months on our call. So I thank you all for being here. I've got some raised hands and some comments. Um, somebody did ask a question about our data and whether or not it, it looked at, um, and does the data allow you to analyze safety felt with going to destinations by where in East Falls respondents live? Uh, it doesn't. Um, that's something that, that maybe could be looked at at a future um, traffic study, but we're, we're not able to kind of spell that out from this. Um, somebody asked about using speed cameras to ticket, which I think really goes to that topic of enforcement. It would be um, safer than having police try to pull speeders over. Aren't cameras already used on Henry Avenue for red light violations? So I'm going to let maybe some some folks from PennDOT and the Streets Department kind of talk about that. Um, and Emily, if I can just inter inter interject just very briefly, um, 
I like to be able to, at some point on our website, uh, post some the results of some good studies on the efficacy of speed cameras. From what I've seen, the data is literally all over the place, uh, from 17% efficacy to 70% efficacy. So I really think that reflects um, a, a, a differential based upon where they're used. Let's say on a on an expressway or or a busy arterial, and there's a lot of factors that probably go into it. Um, one thing of concern that should be concerned, especially to those volunteers from Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, is that in some places, um, in order to put these uh, speed cameras, they're going to have to either shear back tree canopy or remove trees, three trees altogether. So that is something to be taken into consideration because there is a very wonderful effort on the heart of PHS to reline our streets with street trees and we and as a member of the uh, East Falls Tree Tenders, I could not support any effort that would do that. Mm -hmm. Into consideration, it's another piece of street furniture. And Henry Avenue has been cluttered tremendously with street furniture. By that, I mean all kinds of devices uh, to, in an attempt to compel people to drive down, including the, the flashing lights uh, that bookend the 3900 block of Henry Avenue, as well as all the um, large highway grade uh, directional arrows, several of which have been um, plowed down by folks exceeding the speed limit uh, and other things. So many things need to be taken into consideration. Um, I, oh, excuse Samantha, me, not to, excuse me. Excuse wait, can, I'm, quick? Yeah, can you hold on just one moment because there's some other people. Samantha, you had uh, your hand up from, from the councilman's office. Well, did you have a comment you wanted to make? I didn't have my hand up. If I did, it was an oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, there, there's, there's also a couple things. If folks are paying attention in the chat, um, the city has outlawed ATVs on the street as of last week, this week. Um, so let's see how this uh, makes a difference. Um, I, I, there are questions as to why we're now seeing major trucks going down Scotts Lane and Indian Queen Lane, and I want to see if maybe any folks on our panel might have some thoughts about that. And um, I want to start out by maybe, let me start out by calling on Sarah, who's here from the Bicycle Coalition. Um, hi, everyone. I actually, uh, Emily was going to ask if if Representative Delisio could be given a chance to speak because she has an amendment about speed cameras. In short, on, speed cameras are only allowed on one road in Philadelphia, in, in Pennsylvania, and that's on Roosevelt Boulevard. So the law has to be amended, um, and the representative is really taking the lead on that. But that's where a lot of energy needs to be focused. Um, Representative Delisio, do you want to make a comment? Oh, I have comments on a few things. So at the appropriate <laughs> time, you, you let me know. I wish the survey had included it, whether or not folks were aware of the safety improvement plan that PennDOT has had in the works for Henry Avenue. As different folks uh, contact my office from time to time with similar concerns, and we update them on all of the activity that has occurred since 2012. Um, they are pleasantly surprised for the first, most, most part to learn that there have been 13 meetings and 31 communications from my office. We took the time this afternoon to detail all of this. All of this is on my website. Um, and that, in fact, the construction, there was so much input from the East Falls community that PennDOT split the project in two. So Port Royal to the Wissahickon Creek Bridge is the first part of it. And the second part of it is from that bridge down to Abbotsford Avenue in order to allow for all of the input from the East Falls community. And that, in fact, delayed construction for the East Falls community for that safety improvement plans, many of which that are, were identified earlier are incorporated into that project. Some of the suggestions, and I've been in communication with the East Falls Traffic Committee as recently as a, a month ago. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we got a letter from the East Falls, and we have been working with the Traffic Committee all along. So, 
you know, the East Falls Traffic Committee uh, weighed in uh, in January with an evaluation of a plan that was kind of wrapped up in 2017 with the very last meeting being in East Falls. So I think, and David can, you know, help me with this too, because this is a coordinated effort between the Philadelphia City Streets Department and PennDOT for Henry Avenue, which is in fact a state designated route. This is not like when I recently did my kit, redid my kitchen, that I could say to my general contractor, oh gee, I decided to put in a slightly different cabinet here, or can we move this there? And it's between the general contractor and myself. We agree on a price. We agree whether or not it's going to hold up the project. Life goes on. These projects have to meet federal standards, state standards. It has to pass muster with the city plans. These are incredibly involved projects. So at some point, it, the discussion has to end unless there's an egregious oversight. And, and David, please say, wait, Pam, you're painting yourself into a corner if I am. Uh, David Duplos, you, you know who you are. And yep. uh, that, that then, then design and all of the stuff that goes with design has to happen. And those plans need approvals by many, many, many different agencies. The fact that there's a lot of bureaucracy to it is just a fact. We can discuss that all night long as to whether there should be that much bureaucracy. The fact is, there is. So to at, at the 11th hour, I would even say half after the 11th hour, for folks to want that process halted so other considerations could be put into place is like, you're, you're, you're further delaying this months and months and months, plus it's affiliated cost. I mean, what was incorporated into the East Falls portion cost additional funding over and above what PennDOT had budgeted for this. And PennDOT went out and found that funding to make those good suggestions become a reality. We're not even letting this get underway to determine how this will impact you know, the concerns that I hear here and I have heard for years. It got underway in the upper portion on March 29th that if you travel that portion of it, you see some things that are happening and taking place. So even with, and I too, um, Emily made a note about why law enforcement itself wasn't part of this because I have a very extensive file, no lie, on this project. And that included an extensive meeting between state police and local law enforcement so we could all understand as citizens what, what they could do about this. What is, you know, what was in the realm of reality and what was legal to do. So for instance, many people may not realize local law enforcement in Pennsylvania, not just Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, are prohibited from using any type of radar. Prohibited. We're the only state left in the country that prohibits radar. This would be a very helpful tool to help with speeding, and speeding is happening everywhere. Every part of the district, we hear about it, we see it, see it. the irresponsible driving is through the roof. And in fact, I believe I've heard that the pandemic, which took a lot of people off the streets, actually opened the streets up that created more accelerated people going well beyond the speed limit and therefore creating these situations where these accidents have happened and created property damage, uh, personal injury, and in some instances, and one would be too many fatalities. So, um, this has got to be a multi-pronged approach. Uh, as Sarah mentioned about two, three years ago now, I think it was in 2018 in June, I was able, with the support of the East Falls Community Council, and, and John Gillespie or Bill Epstein, if he was on the call, can correct me if I'm wrong, because I wouldn't have proceeded down this path without the support of the community. I represent the community. 
uh, to put speed cameras on Henry Avenue. It was at the same time that the pilot project was going through for Roosevelt Boulevard. And we got that um, amended into a piece of legislation in the House, it went into the Senate, and somewhere along the line in the Senate, we got jacked. I don't know how else to put it, because nobody has been able to give me a explanation, but we got ja I got jacked, and um, that amendment language came out. Otherwise, today, speed cameras, not to be confused with red light cameras, would be on Henry Avenue. And in fact, um, the, the parking authority just issued its first report because speed cameras have now been on Roosevelt Boulevard about a year, I think, give or take. Um, and even though the state approves the legislation, the local government then needs to approve it. And, you know, there's a lot of, like with any of this, a lot of moving pieces, no pun intended. So again, um, there is a radar bill moving out of the house. This is very, or I've never seen a radar bill even pass out a committee in the house. I've seen a Senate bill regarding radar, but a house bill moved. I amended the speed camera legislation into that, and I have mentioned this at quite a few town halls, in press releases, at Pacific Association meetings. So, you know, if this is a surprise, it, it really shouldn't be. The information is out there. And that bill is currently, it was anticipated to run out of the House a few weeks ago. It's gotten uh, caught up in a discussion about racial profiling. I've never seen that aspect of the debate come up pertaining to this bill, but people are actively trying to work, work that out. I was in touch with the um, state rep who heads up our Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus and somebody else on the Republican side, and those details are being worked out. If the bill goes out of the House, it still has to go to the, the Senate and get to the governor's desk. There's also a Senate radar bill moving. Um, but that is thought to be another tool to try to do that. Ray, I'm not sure about what may need to be done in order to make those installations happen. I myself am sensitive to our tree canopy, more than you know, long before I ever came into the legislature. But choices need to be made every single day, and we have to constantly weigh the, the benefits and the costs of proceeding down one path or the other. So, you know, if a few trees are have to get, uh, you know, cut back as a result of this, you know, I would be surprised if the community doesn't find that to be a trade-off that is, is worth happening. And I cringe every time a tree is taken down or, or is not planted. So that, um, and I know the traffic committee has some additional concerns. There were some things in the improvement plan that they blessed and thought were great. There were other things that they made suggestions and PennDOT's answer was, we can't do it at this time. And they did not um, expand on that beyond that, but it didn't say no, it said we can't do it at this time. And then there were some, a few things that the traffic committee objected to. Um, but if we don't get any of this underway, and if there were to be that amount of pressure to totally bring the rest of this project to a halt, we will never know. And nothing, I mean, then that, that, just, that just delays this unbelievably. And I can't tell you how often my office, we stay on top of this. Where do we stand with the contracts? You know, when are they about to be awarded? What is the time frame to begin construction? What is the total time frame till completion? Um, we thought we would be a lot more delayed as a result of the pandemic. I was almost pleasantly surprised that um, we weren't any, any further delayed as a result of that. They know that this is an important project very grateful for all of the community meetings because the folks who gave input for the folks who traverse this road and these uh, uh, you know other roads uh, daily so we are more nuanced on these twists and turns uh, almost than PennDOT can ever be but then PennDOT and the city have to reconcile that with standards and a budget and these are these are the realities that we face. And I, I wouldn't, you know, I would appreciate maybe David 
have I missed any salient points about the process? Because I don't think anybody from PennDOT is on at the meeting tonight. Um, but David, I think you're involved, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're also involved in the back and forth. Have I missed anything that um, would help folks understand here that best efforts have been made all along? No, I mean, I, I think you covered the one thing I would add though, and Sarah can um, can maybe would remember it. I, one time I did a presentation about um, with, to the Vision Zero Conference about traffic calming measures that work and, and, and on a different slide, traffic calming measures that don't work. And you know, there's, there's things that, that can be done like those flashing lights we put up there by Coulter, you know, by the, you know, the, the Kelly house and on, up by Schoolhouse Lane and signage and all sorts of things. And there's things that do work you know, like some of the things that, that we're going to be trying. And it's just the problem is that for the, some of the things that were added in is like I said, you know, they were all they were going to do is they were going to modernize the traffic signals and and make 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 the intersection safer. So, you know, the you know, when it went back to the drawing board is to try to make the, the, the entirety safer, not just the intersection safer. And um, what needed to happen then besides money and design and community input, which there was you know, a substantial amount, thank you, uh, Representative Delisio for that, um, is that the things that were added in um, needed a lot of process to get done. So like, for example, like changing curb lines, adding a planted median in part of it, uh, you know, and, you know, and, and things of, of that nature, things which would really would help. Remember one of the first things when I came into this area, and you know, it's not strictly speaking East Falls, but I saw a name on, on this call who would appreciate it. Uh, for Walnut Lane in uh, Bluebell Hill, you know, how do we calm that? Because that's also been an, an issue for traffic. And you know, when you have a wide open road, you know, you tend to get speeding. So by doing some of these things to narrow the road, you know, to have, you know, to what Ray said, you know, having trees, you know, not too close, but not too far away from the road, things to narrow the roadway, you know, does make traffic, generally speaking, go slower. All that being said is that, you know, just to keep in mind for everybody's sake is that even the best laid plans uh, will only work to the extent that it, it will work. You know, nothing, none of these things is going to be a silver bullet. And so all of these things are going to be, you know, a proportionate improvement over the existing. You know, for example, when you have, a, you know, that dirt bike or a person going, you know, on Kelly Drive, you know, like, or, or the, per, or the nurse that passed out on the 3900 block of, of Henry, you know, there's certain things that, you know, are just going to happen, but certainly the, the things that were added into the East Falls section of this Henry Avenue project were things that were purposefully chosen that were proven to be able to slow traffic down. I'll leave it there. We've, we've had a I just wanted to say, Emily, I want to make sure folks understand. I more than understand frustration, patience, you name it. Um, but it's it's not that this topic has been, and I find particularly if newer people have moved into the community, they're not even aware of the safety improvement plan and are actually very happy to hear that something is in the works. That gives them some comfort. And I don't know, it, it would have to be somebody more technical like David to comment on, you know, folks are patient, but if a block agrees to have something done in a year, I, I, that is just not how the process works. So I think maybe it would be very helpful. It, and that's what we talk about our town hall all the time, the legislative process, because if people don't get the process, don't understand the process, whatever you're advocating for, good luck because then it's all politics and I say elbows to make anything happen. So understanding the process is, is a good way to understand that we may want to respond more quickly and see an outcome, but that may not be how, how um, the, that if the process can move that quickly, you can't do some, like on Henry Avenue, you couldn't do something for just one block. You have to design for a section, I would I would well imagine. Um, and I know that both Ridge and Midvale are also state roads, but the state works then in conjunction with the city. Um, 
I, I, you know, my suggestion, and I've made this at a Vision Zero meeting, hey, my suggestion is put a governor out there. You know, all these cars today are like our computers. Put a governor on the, on the, on the car that says you can't go more than five miles over a speed limit or six miles, and the other governor, if you will, is on the speed limit sign. And, you know, I almost want to say this goes away. It's, I saw an example of that down at Old Dominion, electric scooters, and as soon as you cross onto the campus boundaries, the scooter slows down to the appointed speed limit, and that's a governor on it. And this te John Taylor, the former uh, Transportation Committee chair, tells me this technology exists. And to me, this would be the quickest way to stop speeding, or if you're you know, you've had so many infractions along the line of speeding, um, you have to get a governor for your car or something. I don't know. But we, we don't have the budget to redesign every road and to do all these things. Um, it's, it is a challenge. I, I want to just bring up some, there's, there was some, somebody who raised their hand and had a question or a comment. And then there's also been a lot of comments that have been uh, put into the chat, but I believe, um, I, I think Ray Adams, you wanted to say something or had a comment. I didn't forget you. Oh, uh, yes. Well, I had two comments, but the first one, I, I'm going to forget about that one. But I hear a lot about Henry Avenue. That's been an ongoing problem. And such as the representative said earlier, it's a process and it's a hard process. But I guess we got to continue, you know, uh, fighting that battle to try to get things done for Henry Avenue because it is a speedway. But a, a new concern I have also is down on the other side of Ridge Avenue with this new construction that they're proposing. Is there been any talk about any type of traffic we do or anything about that new building coming or possibility? Oh, okay. If I understood you because you were muffled a little bit. A question about how the construction that's proposed for some of these developments on Ridge Avenue is going to affect traffic? Is that uh, no, what you're asking? Uh, well, well, personally, I know it's going to affect the 4401 building. It's a very large building that they're proposing to build in that section. And I was wondering if they did the due diligence to talk to the traffic committee or anyone else to make sure that, that the traffic is still going to be able to flow on Ridge Avenue. One of the problems also in that same area is that there's no place for a person to actually walk on the sidewalk. And we try to pride ourselves in being a community that have the ability to walk from one area to another. And, and whenever we put a new construction up, those are some of the things they need to think about before they do it. I was wondering if, if anybody on this committee has even looked into the possibility of them changing their, 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 their footprint down at the bottom of, of Ridge and I think Merritt Road. There's, I, I don't want to go down a, 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 a traffic or a zoning rabbit hole on this call, but know that there's actually a lot that's being discussed about changing what that proposed development is. Um, and there, there was, in fact, finally a traffic study, which was only recently made available to us. And um, it's very lengthy and we haven't uh, digested the whole thing yet. So I would strongly encourage you, if um, this topic is important to you, be on that call on, uh, what did we say it was, June 29th, please be there. Um, and also, if you want to follow up with me, I'll put my information, um, I'll, I'll send you my information if you want to follow up with me and I can fill you in more on what is going on regarding that development. Um, I know we've talked a lot about speed. Um, I want to bring up just something that I saw in the chat that was making reference to the trucks that have been traveling um, on some of our side streets and there was some more information added into the chat regarding Indian Queen Lane. McDaniel Trucking has trucks parking in the Soho South lot. Um, they're going down Indian Queen Lane to Soho South and later coming back up Indian Queen Lane. Um, drivers have gotten stuck on this street and they are also apparently sleeping in the Soho South lot. Um, and this has been an issue that I saw a further add to that that comment saying that there might be some dumping going on in that lot from trucks from rental box trucks that appear to have out of state that are out of state plates so um maybe not only traffic and uh police enforcement but maybe we need 
I don't know, the sanitation department on this call to talk about some of these issues. Yeah, there's, um, some, dumping, uh, there's some dumping on that back lot, Emily, uh, about five, six, seven piles. And uh, they're identifiable because there's paperwork in there. They've emptied filing cabinets. Um, properties on Germantown Avenue have been dumped there. And uh, you, there's, there's files, there's papers, there's names. It, it's very easy. Um, it's a very easy track to follow. But the problem is the rear of Soho South, which is also called 3500 Henry Avenue, there's a gate which is left open. So it's very easy for someone to drive in there, drive all the way to the back, uh, dump the contents of their construction project and drive right back out again. Um, so the owners at least need to secure that back lot. Um, I Emma, want to, I, oh yes, does someone else have a comment? I see some more messages and things coming in the chat, but. Yeah, Emily, I think Tom raised a good point. If you look at Tom Flynn, um, Thomas Flynn's comment in chats. Oh yeah, that was the next one I was getting to. Wait, okay, wait, wait, where do you go? Hold on, there's so many. You know what, Tom, do you want to speak? Because now I have so many things in the chat I can't find. I saw your comment. Now I can't 755. find it. Yeah, so my question was just with the increased activation that we've seen at McMichael Park and the opening of the play space in there. I wanted to call particular attention to the intersection of Midvale and Henry. We have multiple bus stops at that location, and there have been repeated accidents when cars have left the, si left the street and ended up on the sidewalk. Um, so I'm wondering, in the in the existing plan, is there anything in the in physically that would be done to reconstruct that intersection? Yes or no? And if yes. no, 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 I can. I I, I would say yes, and I can. You know, I'll let you finish. Let, me finish, let me finish the question. And I guess if the answer is no, um, might that be reconsidered, considering in in light of the increased utilization of the park, which has been an objective of the, of the community for a while. But if you look at the responses to the survey, people, a significant percentage of people are concerned about accessing amenities in the neighborhood because of fear of crossing intersections. And that one I think in particular is the gateway to an amenity of the neighborhood. David, do you wanna, you, you had an answer to that. And do you wanna yeah. remind people also of, of what who you are on this call as well so oh, they know I'm, I'm, a, I'm with the streets department i've been working with this project as long or longer than you know pam has and uh you know i i i, I i've seen it i lived up up this way for i lived on midville by uh was it frederick or Stanton or whatever it is for a little while as well um but as far as henry and midville the one major thing that's that's gonna happen there is that there's going to be a left turn lane and a left turn arrow. So I think part of what happens is, you know, you're coming down from 3900 block where there's speed. You have people who are trying to make a left turn. Uh, there's not a left turn lane, so you get rear-ended and you try to make some, uh, maybe some not great decision making when you're making that left turn. So, you know, there was a left turn there for a short bit for a detour. But now it's going to be there and, and permanent. Now, the other thing that's happening is with the left turn lane, you know, and what's there now is that the lanes, especially on, you know, north of there are narrow, narrow. So, you know, when you get narrow lanes, just like you have on Kelly Drive, you get people driving close to each other and that creates additional crashes. So we're hoping that the arrow in the lane will, you know, at least reduce a, a good chunk of the crashes that, that have happened there. And uh, David, if I can jump in, I have a question. So you are saying that the addition of a left-hand turn southbound on Henry is going to be uh, sufficient enough to reduce the number of incidents of, of crashes. Is that correct? Well, just just like everything else. No, no, you know, I, I, I just want that question answered. Yes. No, naturally. I, okay, so let me. Nothing let me, is a silver bullet. So yes. Uh, I do. Well, I'm, I'm going to ask you a second question because there's already in existence a left-hand turn Northbound, right? Right. Well, we're adding. The, and well, no, no, no. There's already a left-hand turn. You went on record as saying that the significant change to the intersection is going to be a left-hand turn southbound on Henry in response to Tom's question regarding incidents of collision and crashes. 
So yeah. I'd like to, again, ask you, how is that evidenced by the left-hand turn lane northbound there already? So the, the northbound left turn, you know, gets relatively less use. Is and there there's data supporting high that? demand for the southbound left turn, just in the same way originally the project wanted to add a left turn lane and a left turn arrow onto Queen right. Lane, which which we persuaded them to avoid doing for reasons which I'm sure you, you can guess. Okay. okay, but David, my question is, is there data to support your point? Yes, they... PennDOT would have why not hasn't that been but why wasn't that shared in the PennDOT plan? I did not see any data. No member of the committee saw data speaking to that point. I'm sorry, Ray. Data speaking to what point? I, I mean, I, their their plans are not His going to. David's response to Tom's question in regards to the level of incidence of collision, particularly in those collisions which result in vehicles exiting the street and ending up on sidewalks or people's lawns, David said the change is the addition of a, of a left-hand turn in the southbound lanes. So I'm simply asking for proof of how that's going to reduce the kind of incidents that Tom mentioned, and why isn't that evidenced by the existence of a left-hand turn in the northbound lanes? So you have to look you know, so when PennDOT and we, I mean, obviously we reviewed the, the study and we saw where the crash, what direction cars were traveling in when they got into these collisions. So why isn't that data evident? Why isn't that data presented on the PennDOT plans? I mean, this this goes to the heart of why we're, we had issues with PennDOT's plan. And also, as Tom pointed out, the big change since 2017 is the addition of the play space in McMichael Park, which many people will attest that there is a remarkable increase in foot traffic to that park from all points. So we have many more pedestrians crossing Henry Avenue, walking along Henry Avenue, some families used to drive. So there's more traffic both on foot and as well as vehicle to this amenity in the community. And the survey sh shows that people have reservations about their safety when moving about in the community. All we're asking for is some data. And, and again, and to, and, um, to um, Pam's um, uh, explanation uh, or, uh, of, the, uh, of the plan, we made it very clear in our document to Pam that there were, yes, there are parts of the plan that, yes, we give them a round of applause because they comport with world-class standards of traffic calming. For example, the raised to planned, and hopefully still planned, raised intersection at Henry and Schoolhouse Lane, the high friction surface on the 3900 block of Henry Avenue, which is going to do a lot of things. But then when we see South of Coulter and PennDOT's plans specifically state the addition of more posted speed limits, radar flashing signs just to tell people, oh, by the way, you're going over 35, and painting of speed limit in the travel lane, very much like what's already on Lincoln Drive when you come off the City Avenue Bridge, right in the middle of the lanes, it's, it's painted 25 miles per hour. And trust me, nobody tra travels so, 25 miles so per hour. If, if, if no, I may, but, but again, if, I'm, if I may finish, that's what the committee was asking for. We want the data, the studies that show that that part of the plan, the signs, the painting of, 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 of the, the sign, the posted signs of the speed limit, the painting of the speed limit in the travel lane, how effective are they? Where's the data that shows the number of in, the incidence rate dropping to a statistically significant level where they can then deem the, the, the then deem the street safer for travel. So let's let David. Do you have an answer? Do you have a response so, for that? I mean, I, I mean, I can respond certainly. That number one, I'm not PennDOT, so I can't say what or wasn't in a plan. But you know, the Federal Highway Association looks at various traffic interventions and the level, the the, the, the overall level of reduction. And crashes are the overall level of increase in safety on a street based on various interventions. The, 
two things. One, the left turn arrow is in there and it is an incremental increase in safety when these things are added. And two, when we look at the data of how each of the crashes have happened, and if this would have helped or mitigated those individual crashes that we saw on Henry Avenue, we deemed that to be that, that left turn arrow not and left turn lane is, is two different things. Would, you know, would have prevented a, a substantial number of the crashes that have happened over the time that was spent. Would you be able to provide the committee and this, and this community council with, with uh, projections of what would be expected drop in incidents? David, I'll, I'm happy to, Ray, I'm happy to get, uh, contact PennDOT for their projections and for any data that are behind what I believe are generally accepted process and procedures for um, streets and, and highways. There aren't standards that govern this. You, you know, what can be applied and what, what can't or shouldn't be applied. Yeah. Uh, you know, I myself am not an engineer, but we can, Caroline is on the call for my staff as well. We can send requests in for projections for any type of projection that may exist for anticipated reductions in accidents. And we can also ask for if you're specifically looking for any data behind the left-hand turn southbound at Midvale and Henry, uh, the rhyme and reason for that, we can also submit that question. I've got a raised hand from Sarah from the Bicycle Coalition. Well, oh, I, someone else after her. Hi. Um, so the a lot of the streets that were talked about in the survey are um, described, I think, maybe in the presentation early on, were, were streets other than um, Henry Avenue, Fox, Roberts, Midvale. Fox and Roberts are on the high injury network, which means they should get more attention um, than, than streets that are not. Interestingly enough, Midvale is not on the high injury network. This is streets that have been identified as um, being responsible for 80% of the fatalities and, and um, severe injuries in the city. So they're this is data data showing that these are the most important streets that really need to be targeted. Henry, of course, is one of them. So um, I think there's a lot to think about and talk about with respect to um, what kinds of traffic calming could be done on Fox and Roberts or other corridors or blocks that um, you know where, in the, especially recently, there have been any increase in in incidents. Um, but I will say this, and sort of wearing my advocacy hat, is that. The streets department, unfortunately, has very little resources available for traffic calming. It has some, but not enough. And, um, and I really regret to say that um, for the past month and a half, I've been working on the budget, advocating for more resources for the streets department, specifically for things like speed cushions and et cetera. And I don't, I don't think, and not successfully, unfortunately. And this is where your committee and your folks really need to talk to Councilman Jones, talk to the mayor, um, really make it clear that the streets department needs more, more ammunition to come in and deal with these kinds of problems. Um, and, um, and turning around requests in a year, I will say is um, very, very difficult. Um, but, so you, there's a, there is an important role for you to play, which is to really heighten that this, these issues are, are, are terribly important and need to be prioritized. And that's, that's where your elected officials come in. And Sarah, I would add to your comment that we hear this discussion at the federal level on an infrastructure bill. I mean, the state general assembly passed an infrastructure bill in November, of 2013. I remember it very specifically. I can even tell you the date uh, because it had been almost 15 or 16 years since we had done any type of infrastructure bill because it's fraught with increases in taxes and other things. Um, so we didn't get an infrastructure bill out of the previous federal administration, even though it was very much anticipated. This administration is pushing hard and early. If you've 
tuned into the news at all, you heard through the weekend discussion about an, infra an infrastructure bill. And both Sarah and David, correct me if I'm wrong, if that infrastructure bill goes through at the federal level, is it going to put speed? Is it going to have a line item in there for speed cushions on Midvale? Of course not. But it's going to have a ripple effect on how money is used at the state level and then at the local level. It will free up money. So local money can be used for these much more local issues. State money, can we can plan on the bigger issues and maybe uh, add more things into safety improvement plans because the federal dollars will be there to support that. That's how I see that unfolding. And um, we need it desperately. So when you're contacting elected officials, don't forget your congressman. And ours is Dwight Evans, who I suspect is extremely supportive of this particular topic and issue. So, but start start with the U.S., you know, our two U.S. senators, our one congressman, and then, you know, we wrap up locally with uh, the councilman. I want to I wanna draw our attention to the fact it's 8.30. I usually like to keep these meetings to 90 minutes, but I also want to make sure that everyone, um, especially our, you know, our, our residents and community members um, have a chance to to speak up or ask questions um, or make make relevant comments. So I wanted I want to do one last. If anyone wants to um, ask a question or make a comment, either to the traffic committee or to some of our guests, Roxanne, are you raising are you raising your hands? And yes, the safety improvement plan is in the chat. If for those of you who haven't found your way to PennDOT's website, we posted the safety improvement plan in the chat. Yes. Yes. Um, yes, I, I would like to make a comment. Uh, we've, we've talked about local government, state government, and federal government. <clears throat> when do we do something about the actual drivers that are causing these fatalities? Um, tougher laws more rules and more accountability uh, public service education is really needed so we we haven't touched on that subject but you know <laughs> if we if we do some things in that area we won't have to worry about adding all of these safety measures and uh, flashing lights and roundabouts and so i, I just think that's a very important point to add to this discussion. Roxanne, is that, um, are we looking for someone specifically to answer that or is that more just the rhetorical question for everyone to keep in mind? I, I think it can be both because oh. <laughs> as I stated, we have not talked about it. Um, I did do the survey and I did add that, you know, accountability is is so important when you get behind that wheel you just need to be aware and and we're not getting that you know you, you can go anywhere as it was stated in the city of philadelphia and people are reckless drivers and there's there's no public uh statements made about it there's no police officers at most of these events so we we need to work on public awareness as well Roxanne, I did ask our, our previous Secretary of, Tra uh, Secretary of uh, Transportation at PennDOT, Leslie Richards, who's now our general manager at SEPTA, f a couple of years back, exactly for an awareness campaign for speeding, because I'm telling you, it is everywhere. So, you know, it, it was interesting. Resources are, again, often cited as the reason why we can't go forward with lots of really good ideas. Maybe it's time to raise that idea yet again, particularly if this infrastructure bill at the federal level goes through and kind of um, frees up some money. Uh, it, you know, it, it does in this case have a trickle down effect, frees up some dollars and maybe it's time to raise that again. And, you know, maybe, um, you know, Rep Parker and I can do that in conjunction with the you know, the senator's office and the councilman's office advocating for such an awareness campaign. I don't think it hurts. We still see campaigns out there, click it or ticket, particularly around the holidays. We all know what that means. You better have your seatbelt on. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I, there, you make a very valid point. I've got, uh, Meg's got her hand raised. Oh, wait, hold on. Meg, Meg has her hand up. Yeah, that's, that's what I was about to say. Meg has her hand raised. Um, I don't know if she's, I realized that I, I tabled your earlier comment, Meg, uh, about that 75% rule. So I don't know if we're, we might come back to that or you may have something no, new for us. No, something <laughs> else. Okay. Uh, I have a back and forth with Josh Cohn in the councilman's office because a number of years ago, the streets department made a presentation about putting a roundabout in these pool, a, moder a little roundabout on Fox Street. And the neighbors supported it, and nothing's happened. And I asked Josh to inquire. And he said we would get an answer. And the Community Council Traffic Committee has asked more than once the Streets Department to tell us what the status of that project is. Is it going to be built or not? Uh, so Josh said, we would learn that answer to that question this evening. I would like the answer to the question. Is that on the table? Is it scheduled or has it been dumped? Uh, so I'm not the best one to answer, but I'll do the best I can, Meg. Uh, it definitely still is on the table and is, uh, you know, on a list to be done. Um, there is a gentleman named Gus Sherbaum who is on some of the, the emails that you that you know, we're asking that question because I know that Ray or John or whoever right. had asked that question. Um, so I had some, I'll just say informal chats. So like, obviously he's the best one to answer. Uh, so basically that he put it this way. He's that there are temporary solutions and there are long-term solutions for the roundabout. The, the he, there's a conversation to be had about, uh, the, the, the timing of short-term and long-term implementation of the roundabout due to the Calder Street Bridge closure, which will be in, what, 2023, I would assume, and the, and the subsequent reopening, which would allow for the bus to relocate back to Midville Avenue. And I mean, I guess it's been on Queen Lane for, you know, a decade or more at this point. Um, so... I think the conversation it had is that what can be done for a roundabout with temporary improvements until the time where you can do a more long-term improvement once the bus is relocated. Now that's that's just what I got. I can't really answer too much with what what and who's what it would look like, but that is that is the answer that I got from Mr. Sherbaum. All right. Well, that is something more than we've gotten. And I would request on behalf of the committee, and I'm sure the committee and community council would support the request, that we be kept in the loop and get responses when we ask questions like this. I mean, we have just been stonewalled. And there's, there's, if that's what's going on, then I think it would have been respectful of us and our safety and concerns to respond instead of ignoring. We shouldn't have to go to the councilman's office and ask him to intervene to get that an answer. Yeah, so, I, wanna, uh, I just want to support what Meg has just said, David. I, I myself placed at least two, possibly three inquiries by way of email uh, to Gus and John Gillespie also placed a couple of inquiries by way of email and we received no response. So when we have no response, that just raises more questions than we had before we sent the questions to Gus. So it certainly would go beyond just simple good manners to respond. It would certainly be a practical thing to do so. At least give us some framework by which, don't forget, we're not asking this on behalf of ourselves. We're an advocate body for the greater community of Falls. We're asking on behalf of the community, particularly among the people that the streets department asked to attend a charrette, I believe, four or five years ago, in which, by the way, the streets department was extremely professional, did a wonderful presentation, made an excellent effort educating people on the benefits of an implementation of a roundabout. And then once people were converted, because there were many skeptics in the in, uh, among the residents, 
uh, and then nothing happens. Sorry if I'm laughing, but nothing happens for four years. So it would be wonderful to receive a response when we make the effort to, uh, to, uh, to make these inquiries. And again, um, regarding Henry Abbott, without beating a dead, without being a further, I, I think it's only fair that the community get some more quantitative information from PennDOT on these questions that we have raised. We don't do this arb arbitrarily or just to satisfy personal ego or what have you. Uh, as we said, and I want to thank Sarah Clark Stewart very much for her wonderful insight and her contribution to tonight's discussion. You really um, have contributed a great deal and helped us to understand the situation a lot better. But as I said, Pam and, and State Rep. Uh, Darisha Parker, uh, there are facets to the plan which do make good sense. There are parts to the plan on which we still have questions and we're concerned about efficacy, efficiency, and, and reliability of these measures to significantly reduce the, the kinds of incidents, particularly, and as you know, as it runs from the Falls Center uh, to, to, to the bridge, there is a pattern to the way these, these incidents do occur. In fact, I could share the photo library with you to show you exactly what the aftermath of all of these collisions look like. So there is a definite pattern. So maybe at this point, and hopefully um, there could be some kind of a follow-up strategy session, uh, perhaps with the members of the traffic committee and folks here are our, our, our invited guests by which we can get a much more, hammer out a much, as David said, there are long-term plans or short-term plans, well, some kind of a plan that speaks to something somewhere on the horizon where we can see some authentic um, solutions to deal with these historical patterns uh, of speeding and disregard for traffic. Roxanne, you made a very wonderful point about how people are not listening to their higher angels or they're, they're, they're just disregardful of the rules. And as a retired school teacher, yes, it's, it's, I can say it's terrible to see that, but what can be done? How can we go back and educate folks to, be, to listen to our higher angels and obey laws the way they should, but it's sadly not happening. And so those are personal issues between drivers and, and their God. But again, we, we need solutions. And I guess, I'm, so can we get some kind of a follow-up session by which the traffic committee can meet, perhaps with members of PennDOT, Streets Department, perhaps with our elected representatives, and again, try to flesh out in a long-term plan something that can really successfully address these issues. Ray, I want to comment to that, that until this is in place, I'm not, then, I'm not sure what we're discussing. We're, we're happy to send to PennDOT to try to get up some backup material for the specifics that are there, but convening in four to six weeks, this is the, the, this is the plan. We need to give this plan an opportunity to be implemented, evaluate it, and then see what, what works or doesn't work. Nobody has a crystal ball here, but I have every confidence that these agencies are using standards that are standards that are well established and in fact well tested. If I doubted that, the entire, no pun intended, infrastructure for, you know, having faith in any aspect of bureaucracy would be non-existent. So I we're I, I, I like to say we're we're always happy to meet, but mm -hmm. I'd like the topic to be a topic that isn't a sort of review of what we have reviewed. That's why I uh, asked staff to help pull together all of these interactions that have occurred. Um, they have been, if there had been one or two inter interactions on this list, I'd say, you know what, maybe we missed something along the way, but we've had a lot of interactions. So maybe if we can refine what we're meeting about. And, okay. and that's I, I would be happy to have a chat with you, refine what we're beating about, and give you that confidence level because I too am data driven. I am, you know, we're very happy to work with you to dig for that data. And just like you, you talked about with the roundabout, just tell us what's going on. Let's let's maybe focus on the data and what that means, and then we are pleased to have that meeting. 
Um, Representative Delisio, thank you very much. We we always know in East Falls that we can count on your support for the issues that we, we care about for our community. I've got a raised hand. I want to call in one more person and then we're going to start to look at wrapping this up. Sarah from Bicycle Coalition. Coalition. Uh, I don't, I'm, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm speaking too much, but I just want to reiterate what the representative has said. A lot of time and a lot of money is being poured into that highway safety plan for Henry Avenue. It's got to be left given time to actually play out before you get real answers. Um, I would recommend focusing on the other roads that are also giving the, the community problems um, and seeing if things can be done that are not so expensive, but but still cost money um, to, to address those, those problem areas. Sarah, thank you very much. I just want to, I want to thank everyone for their time on this call, um, community members and our invited guests for, for, for participating in a really helpful conversation. I know that Ray is going to be following up, um, and maybe looking at setting an agenda and, and, and looking at how we can start, what other things we can be doing here in the community to make some changes. Um, there were some other things added into the comments. Um, especially some some references to SEPTA. I don't know if maybe SEPTA should have been part of this call as well. Um, whether it be SEPTA drivers and how they pay attention to or don't pay attention to speed limits, but also just um, you know what improvements can be made to our um, uh, SEPTA in service in this neighborhood that might um, cause more of us to leave our cars parked in front of our houses and not be driving them, and maybe that would help a little bit. So, um, Ray, I hey, don't know Emily. Oh, yes, Representative hey, Parker. Hey, how are you? Um, I was just circling back when you were talking about the SEPTA. I know I'm meeting with them about another issue. So, if you need me, we can have um, or we can have them on another call. Um, just let me know what you want to do moving forward so we can get a resolution with, with SEPTA. And also, um, I heard someone mention about the speed bumps or something that they were talking about. Um, not speed bumps. The, um, it had something to do with Councilman Jones's office. Yeah, I know that there's a budget time for city council. If there's something specific earmarked that we need for a specific neighborhood, this would be the time for that ask. So, Emily, we can circle back with that as well. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Ray, You're quite welcome. You, have, you have anything to say to, to wrap up for this evening before I close this out? Well, except... <laughs> Unfortunately, we did not d devote enough time to the other to the issues on the other streets, Midvale, Fox, um, Ridge. Uh, what's going on in 3,029 or the 2,900 block of Queen Lane? So, um, sometime we have to re-meet and uh, streets, and and it's important too that if we can iron out how we can get action on streets on which there is a different jurisdiction, Midvale being under the state, so forth. Fox, I think, is under the city. Uh, how we can work around that issue successfully to, you know, address some of the things we we highlighted at the beginning. That is the high frequency of, of collisions uh, in these streets, and of course, there's subsequent effects on the, the quality of life, property, and and the threat and the threat to life too. So, we'll have to meet again at some point. Yes. Well, I know that obviously the traffic committee is planning to meet. I would invite anyone who's on this call who has further questions, comments, things, um, shoot an email to info at eastfallscommunity.org. I believe that is our address. Um, or feel free to reach out to me. Um, and we're going to continue to be following up. I really appreciate you all being here. Just of note, Beer Garden this Thursday. Um, we may or may not have community council meetings in July and August. We sometimes like to go quiet in the summer. We'll see what happens. So it's possible I'll see you in the next few months or we won't see each other again until September. Um, please, though, uh, join the zoning meetings that are coming up if that's of interest to you and concern. And um, if it's not, I would say it should be because zoning has a lot of impact on what our community looks like as well. So I want to thank everyone for their time tonight. Really appreciate it. Please stay safe out there, obviously, because we just highlighted all these safety issues. So be cautious when driving. Um, and have a really good night.